session on how to build the ultimate issue tracker using Microsoft Teams, Microsoft Lists, and Power Automate. My name is Norm Young. I'm coming to you from uh, very chilly Canada today. I'm also a Microsoft MVP in the Office Apps and Services category. Uh, I, I intentionally uh, uh, called this session Building the Ultimate Issue Tracker, um, not because it's it's about this particular build, but it's it's more about uh, the power that we have in in using these uh, these apps and services like Teams and Listen Power Automate, where we can take something like a a list template and extend the functionality out uh, in such a way that we can uh, help our users achieve their goals, uh, match up to business processes and uh, guide them in a, in a new way of working and adding value throughout. So uh, my hope is that you can see the, the, the potential when you combine Teams lists and Power Automate together and uh, uh, consider using this for uh, a platform, if you will, for uh, those situations when there, there's no app for that and uh, uh, bringing the work uh, and bringing information to your users in, in the place that they work will be one of the uh, the valuable things that that you can do as you advocate for them uh, when you're 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 helping to uh, um, modernize their 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 business processes and their their way of working. Before we get into the uh, the session, uh, if you're able to, please donate to the. Uh, Chicago Public Schools Fund uh, through the Children First Fund. It's uh, it's a great organization, and any donation uh, is valued. Uh, and thanks to our sponsors. Um, without them, a lot of this wouldn't be possible. They uh, uh, have some great raffles and giveaways, so so be sure to uh, under to see what they have available, of course, and also to uh, make sure you get those secret words so you can win that raffle prize. And so what I'm going to show in this session are a lot of demos on how to configure this solution using the, these out-of-the-box tools. And we'll be given a, a, a platform or a foundation in which we can start building. Now, you know, in this case, it's the, it's the art of the possible and your particular needs may not need all of this functionality. You should only add on what you need, but again, trying to show what's possible and to show how easy it is to get started. And so I'm in my team and we'll create a new uh, list. We'll bring that list into the team and that's going to be the reoccurring theme. I, I want information to come to where my users are working. Uh, I create the, the new list tab inside of my team, and I'm going to select the issue tracker template. Uh, Microsoft has invested time and energy into putting their best foot forward for what issue tracking can look like, and I'm going to use that. Uh, I don't need to reinvent the wheel just because I want to have a more hands-on experience. I'm going to take what they have, and I'm going to leverage it. But I'm in Teams, and you know, it's, it doesn't have all the, the same feature parity as SharePoint and Microsoft List would have. So for a lot of our work, we're going to jump out of Teams for the build and work inside of SharePoint. Um, and I'm going to change this to the list view. It's just a personal preference. And one of the things that we're going to need to do is to uh, copy that, that site title and we'll use it throughout the rest of the build. So what I want to do is I want to create a folder associated with each issue in my list. You're probably saying, you know, I can attach files to a list item, and you're right, but that has barriers to productivity that your users may not appreciate. Having to download an attachment, edit, save, upload an attachment, maybe a few extra steps that they don't need. It might be a better experience for them if we have them in a dedicated subfolder where they can work using those Office apps and services that we all use day to day and work in that natural environment. 
So inside of our list, we'll have this folder column, and in this folder column, we'll link out to that folder. Doesn't seem that high tech, and for the most part, it's not. But what we don't want are overwhelming links that are sitting in that column that are not readable. And so what we'll do is we'll create the folder, and we'll also put a very uh, uh, viewer-friendly name inside of that column with the link. And so the first thing that I'm doing is creating a variable called var folder name. And what I want to do is concatenate something that I know will be unique, and I'll use the ID, the auto number that comes with lists, and I'll put a hyphen in, and then I'll put the issue name. So if users are scrolling through, the list where all the or the 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 document library where all these folders live, um, they'll be able to not just look at an ID number which is meaningless, but also see the description to help target their navigation. Um, there is a chance that you could have like named issues, and so having that unique number means we're not overwriting anything. So the, our next action that we're going to take is to use the SharePoint flow action uh, to create a folder. We'll put in our site name. And that's going to go to our documents document library. Keep in mind that we're working in Microsoft Teams. So I'm going to hard code in the channel name. There's ways of dynamically doing this, but for now I'm just using general because I know that's where we're going to work. And then I'm putting in the folder name. So it will go to the site, it'll locate the document library, it'll find the general channel, which is just a folder, and then underneath it will create a subfolder. So let's test this and we'll do a manual test and we'll go back to issue tracker and then we'll create a new item. And when we started creating the flow, we did it as an automated cloud flow, which means it will trigger when a new item is created as its starting event. We'll give this second, we'll give this a second to run. We see it's successful and there is our uniquely named folder dynamically named. And that's great. Uh, one of the outputs that comes with the create folder is the URL. And if you've ever seen a SharePoint sharing link, they're, they're long and they just keep going and they're not readable at all. So to overcome that, we're gonna do something a little more high tech and we're going to use the uh, send uh, an HTTP request to SharePoint. Now this is using like uh, the SharePoint REST API, but it's packaged up for you. You just need to know some of the basics for this to work. Now I'm not a developer, so like, I don't know what most of this is, but referencing docs or the, the PMP community samples, I'm able to figure this stuff out. So I go to my site. My method is going to be post, which means I'm going to post um, uh, data back to the site. I'm going to give it a URI, and that is going to be um, the, the internal name and location of what we're doing. And so I'm going to look for lists, and I'm going to search by the title of list items, and then I'm going to put in the ID number into items. Kind of makes sense when you read it through, but to take it on first pass, you know, it, it can be a bit overwhelming and a bit developerish. We'll paste in the header information and then we'll do the body. And this is the body. This is the important part. This is where we will uh, give our URL for the folder location a description and then that ugly link back. Uh, but there's a few gotchas in this one. Okay, so the first one is, you'll notice that the text I'm highlighting looks just like the list name, and that's the internal list name. But you see there's the X0020, but when we look at it by the get by title, it's issue space tracker. We look on the website or the web URL and it's issue percent 20 tracker. So we've got all of these different versions of the same thing. But what's important is the internal list name. And this is the only way I know how to get it. It's by doing an API call from the browser and it lists the internal name. And I'll paste in the, uh, uh, the, the, the API link to this after. It's also included in the, the, the notes of this presentation should you want them. Okay, so we'll delete those variables. And so I'm coming into the description and I'm going to use the folder name. So that's the ID number and then the title. And then the URL, there's a link that's created um, or provided by the, the new folder creation. So we'll put that in. Let's save it. Let's do another test run. 
So what we're expecting is a very clean URL provided inside of our list. It's created and we get this wonderful, very simple URL and not this big ugly text thing that just scrolls off the screen. Pretty cool. Yeah, feel free to uh, ask questions in the chat or come off of mute. I'm doing my best to watch the chat as the uh, the demos go. So th this next uh, flow pattern that I'm going to show is, you know, how do we get data into a list? Now you can create a list from an Excel spreadsheet, but that's a one-time run. How do we repeatedly do that? Well, in this pattern, I'll show you. Um, there might be situations where you have data coming out of like a an ERP system, and that list is maybe an, an, inter, an intermediary, a, a storage area or a processing area where you're going to do uh, that ERP processing through that integration. And so moving data into a list is something that happens. And there's quite a bit of uh, use cases out there for that. And so, uh, before I do that, I want to add uh, a bit of value to the list. Uh, I'm creating a column called due date. And what this will do, it'll give me uh, an anchor point later in the demo to have uh, value added through uh, uh, the business processes, business process, excuse me, by showing um, when something should be resolved so people can work towards that date. And because we do that, we can show when we have uh, uh, unfortunately exceeded that, that duration and hasn't been resolved. And then uh, finally, we will uh, uh, use that as a basis for sending reminders to our users before uh, this issue becomes to a due date or the business process expires. So what I'm doing now is I've created the column and now I'm applying conditional formatting. And, and what I'm saying is, uh, any open item, that's all of these and if or ifs, where I'm, I'm saying the status basically has to be new, blocked, or in progress. And if it's uh, the due date is uh, uh, before today, then you know, flag it. And so I'm going to do that uh, by visually uh, changing, conditionally changing the format of that text. So the, the due date now will be bold and red. And when my users come into this, this list of items that may be affecting them, uh, or, or sorry, that are assigned to them, um, they will see the ones that have been uh, uh, highlighted uh, visually. And so I'm going through and I'm testing and I'm changing the status to complete, don't bold it. Put it into in progress, now it's bold. So uh, my users come in and we're able to focus their attention and hopefully their energy towards the things that uh, make the most sense. So now let's get this data out of Excel. Uh, it's I've got it in, in an online storage. Uh, it has to be OneDrive or SharePoint. Uh, and you'll notice I'm highlighting the, the date columns. This is the, the trickiest part about uh, importing data is that uh, dates are not handled or translated well between uh, SharePoint and Excel. And the only uh, prerequisites are, you know, the schema's got to match up. The columns have to line up with what you're trying to load. And it has to be in the form of a table. So I'm going to create another uh, Power Automate flow, but this time it's going to be a scheduled flow. We're going to run on a timer. Hi, Gary. Uh, great question. Absolutely. There is a uh, an option inside of the list views where you can assign it to something called me. It's like a it's a, it's a construct. It's just called me, um, but it's definitely a, a, you have a a people column or a person column in that uh, list view filter options and then assign to me or equals me. And it's just like a uh, square bracket, me square bracket. But yeah, definitely there. I don't know what you mean by uh, restrict, not filter. If you're talking about securing, saying like you cannot see certain rows, well, that's complicated. And your options are limited. Uh, the person who creates an item can see it and no one else can see it. That's one option. That's not the default. And then uh, 
the default is that everyone can see everything and do everything that their permission group allows. So if you're trying to create a group of users for a group of data driven by a business requirement, lists will probably not be the right platform for you. You can hide the data, but you'll never secure it. So in my flow, uh, I've set the timer, I've identified my Excel listing, and now I'm pulling the data out. I, I said that there were two date columns, and because there's two date columns, I'm going to have to convert them. To do that conversion, I'm using these variables called var date reported and var due date to uh, facilitate that conversion. So I'm going to create a loop. That loop is going to be based on the rows present in the Excel table. And so now I'm going to set the variable. So for each row in Excel, I'm going to loop. While I'm in the loop, I'm going to set the date to each of those variables, and then I'm going to insert. And when I do the insert, I'm going to do the, the actual conversion. And there's some crazy power automate uh, expressions that you have to put in to, to get this to work. All right, so the first one is date reported, uh, and I set it to the uh, Excel option or the Excel column. I'm having the same treatment for the due date. And now I'm going to create an item. We've read our files, now we're going to create into the list. Uh, Gary, just, just a couple more follow-up points. People try to uh, obscure the data. And if the business process says that's sufficient enough, uh, that's great. But if it's the an absolute scenario where Gary, you can't see my data and I can't see yours or our team can't see each other's lists usually don't work in that situation. And then you have to consider another platform like Dataverse or Teams or Dataverse. And those are more of a, a, a traditional database management platform uh, without all the heavyweight stuff that you get with uh, something like SQL Server. So now I'm creating the item and I'm mapping up the columns from Excel that correspond to the columns inside of uh, the list. And now I'm doing my first conversion. And so I have to add days. So I have to add the number of days from 1899, December 30th, to the date that we have in our variable. This is you know, the mechanics of Excel. This is how it stores the date. So we have to add the number of days towards that to make this conversion. Yeah, and Gary, filtering, you you have a, a plethora of options to filter a view um, by the different attributes that are there. If you have a high volume list, uh, you'll probably you'll probably want to be filtering anyway, uh, especially if you're trying to leverage something like Power Apps um, for the front end of a list-based solution where uh, you're exceeding 500 records uh, or 500 5,000 items. Excuse me. Um, the Power Apps or lists, sorry, cannot return more than 5,000 items per call. It can store like 33 million records in a list, but it cannot return more than 5,000 at any one time. So if you have high volume of data, you're going to want to be using filters as a way to work around that problem anyway. But your application or whatever you're using or your user experience has to know to filter. It's not actually as bad as it sounds. It's just you can only pull back so much data. So now that we've done the conversion of the dates, we're going to go through, read the Excel. Uh, we've done those crazy date formats. We've lined up our, our, our columns to mash Excel to uh, the list. And now we're creating everything or importing, if you will. And if I go back over to my list, we see now that everything's populated. All of our folder locations got automatically created because our previous job was based on that create new item trigger. So that's great. We didn't have to worry about that. Uh, 
the, the column formatting that we added to due date uh, is showing itself. We know already where to focus our attention. And this is one of those things where we took what was delivered and we added some value to it and we're able to bring value to uh, our users faster by taking these types of approaches. So one of the things that comes delivered with the, uh, uh, the issue tracker template with Microsoft lists is this days old column. And it's great. It's a SharePoint calculated column. Uh, it, it looks at the, uh, the difference between the date that it was reported to the current date and tells you how old the, uh, the issue might be. And like I said, that's great. But what it can't do is reflect the business process. And perhaps the business process only wants to know about the age of an issue if it's open. And the calculated column is not able to achieve that. So we'll use a Power Automate uh, flow pattern to create this day old new column and we'll populate it only when and only if it's open. So you saw me creating a, a, a new days old column. And now I'm gonna come into flow and I'm going to create a scheduled flow. And this thing will just run every day for us. And it will do the, the house, housekeeping type of work that my users would have to do manually if we didn't have something in place. So I'm going to create a new variable. And this will be called our date reported. This will be a string. And so now I need to go find all of the items that are still open. So I'll use the SharePoint get items action. And in the, later in the session, you hopefully you can see why I'm going through the, the, the effort of renaming all of the actions. This flow will eventually have multiple get items. And if they were just called get items and get items too, it could be pretty easy to get lost in what purpose each action fulfilled. So I'm making, I'm taking the time to rename them and, and would highly recommend that you do the same. Um, so you're able to follow your own work or others are able to do it as well. So in this case, I've done something called a, a OData filter query. And I'm just saying, just give me those records that are open. So status, equal to uh, new, status equal to open, status equal to block. And those are what the business have told me. And so now I'm taking that record set and I'm going to throw it into a loop. And that's what we're seeing with the apply to each. And I'll, I'll base it on the value coming from that get items. And now I'll create a new item. And I'm going to set the variable that we created earlier for the uh, date reported. This one's complicated. Well, maybe not this particular uh, step, but when we do the actual uh, um, conversion and calculation on this update item, it's it's not the prettiest function, but it's the one that unfortunately we have to use. So we've got our data set, we've got it into a loop, we're using the variable and we're putting each entry of that data set in there for further conversion. And now we're going to uh, update those items in the data set, and we're using this update item. Uh, so I have to use the, the ID from the previous get items. Uh, you'll notice that I'm replacing the title version. There's a little red asterisk beside the word title inside the uh, action. Uh, it's required, so we have to have a value there. I, I'm not overwriting it because I want to, it's just I have to. And you also notice that I'm doing it for the uh, uh, the status value. The status value is a is a is a choice column, and so um, and it has a default. So you have to uh, uh, replace it with the value from the get items. And it's not really a replace; more of it is as it is a uh, keeping that change forward. Um, the uh, I, I'm going to rewind this just for a quick sec and I'll start from here. The uh, this conversion 
sorry about that. Let me start there. This conversion is complicated. It's not one that I came up with. It's one that I got from the community, but this is how you do that date difference calculation in SharePoint. It's it's ugly. Um, it's it's blogged about. I know I blogged about it and others have as well, but it's just one of those things that uh, you have to leverage the good work done by others to get your job done. And so we have a, a quick look at our list and we see that the uh, the days old new is not populated. We'll run our test. Um, we've got a record set we've looped through. And so now we see that the days old column only populated for items that are open. So that's what the business process uh, mandates. And we also see that the conditional formatting that we applied is only flagging those items that are more than 30 days old. So let's move on to our next pattern. And this pattern is inspired by some work I did in a previous career where we had business processes that could change states. They could go from a short term to a long term state. And each state change had a, a different business process and needed to be in a different list where those different controls and processing could happen. So I'm simply going to create a new list based on the existing one. And the list uh, experience creation experience is great here. I can say create new list based on old list. I'm given the same interface I was when we created the issue tracker template. And just like that, within seconds, I have this new list. I didn't have to recreate anything. And so now uh, I'm going to go back into Power Automate and we're going to create a different type of flow. We're going to create a button flow. And a button flow means like you, you are uh, you know, virtually clicking a button to make the action happen. Our other flows were based on a timer or a schedule, or they were based on an event like a new item was created. And there's all these different uh, triggers, but this case, this is being manually selected. And so this is why they call it a button flow. <clears throat> and we'll see the virtual button near the end of it. When the flow is built, it gets connected back to the list. So there's no actual button to press, but there is something we do have to click. So when we do trigger this flow, it's going to give us the bare minimum information. It's going to give us like an ID number and maybe who clicked the button. So we immediately have to say, give me all of the information. So we'll do uh, get item call. This will only bring back one record and one record only. And we'll set it up to uh, go against our source list. And we'll uh, get all of the, uh, the information that we need from that entry so we can move that into the other list where I'm calling it an archive in this process, but it could be that state change that we talked about in the business processing. And so we will simply use the, the create item uh, action. And this time it'll be against the issue tracker archive, which is our destination list. And we'll configure that. Uh, I really hope everyone's having a, a good time at the event and that um, you come out of this uh, uh, energized from the, the things that the, the other speakers have, have shown you that you may not have thought of. New features that are, are rolling out to uh, the different uh, apps and services in Microsoft 365 or the Power Platform. I know I come out of these things uh, happy to have uh, seen things and always try something new. It may not stick, but always try. Uh, so as, a, as I'm going through and filling out the create item action, I'm just doing a simple mapping. Nothing high tech here. No funky uh, expressions to make this stuff go over because it's in SharePoint. If we were doing something like a, a choice column that allowed uh, multiple selections, well, it would be a bit more complicated, but or or a, a list item with attachments, it would definitely be more complicated. But these are things that uh, uh, others have figured out and. I'm sure someone's got a blog post out there on how to do it. I know I do, so feel free to check out my stuff at uh, at my blog site. All right, so we've got the item, we've created the new item, and now we're going to delete the old item as our housekeeping and cleanup 
action. So we'll configure it to point to the right one, and I'll use the, uh, for the selected item ID, we'll save that. And now we'll come back into our list. <clears throat> Excuse me. We'll select a row. In this case, we have a duplicate row. And I'll go to automate and we'll give it a second and it pops up dynamically. There's our button. And when I click this, it already knows what ID number it is and then it will execute that flow with the metadata that it needs. It's all good. So we're over at our destination list, the archive, and it's moved the row over. And if I do a refresh, it should be cleaned up. So the value in here is that you're able to archive or soft delete items, move data around, one of those core processes that we do in IT. But more importantly, you're taking a business process that was in one state, think of short term, with a single set of conditions and business processes around it, to a different state, think long term, with a different set of business rules for it. This is the value here, and we're not creating an ERP solution or an enterprise application to this. We're configuring the solution. Cool stuff. And attainable. You don't have to be some IT wizard to do this because I'm definitely not. So if we think back three years ago, maybe even four years ago, the SharePoint list experience was called that classic view and it was kind of bland and you got what you got. Uh, and then a few years later, Power Platform came to be and we had the ability to use Power Apps to customize the form. That's not for everyone. Not everyone wants to make those changes, but now we have this excellent option for users and that's just to edit the columns in the form. And so as you see that I'm deselecting, rearranging items in the form, I'm able to make this flow in a way that makes sense for the business users. Maybe it sequentially flows the, the pattern that they do, but, and this is great, but we can do so much more now that we have uh, column formatting and that, that tooling that we apply to columns and views. Now we can apply them to the form. So I'm going to jump over into a Microsoft Docs uh, article on how to get started with configuring the layout. And we have this nice example, and I'm simply gonna copy the code. I'm going to go into my new form, new edit form it's called, and I'm gonna configure the layout. So I'm going to apply changes to the header. Right now it says new item. I've literally just pasted in the code and immediately it changes. I have an icon and some text that were relevant for that example, but I can easily customize this to suit my needs. And the value here is partially to make it more attractive for our users, but it's also to help gain their trust, to uh, get their excitement, if you will, uh, to use this solution that you may be creating for them because it's it's being personalized for them. They're more likely to use something that you create for them than they are generically. And so with these simple changes, just changing the icon, um, having that bold dynamic text to be the issue thing, I've added a bit of value and it wasn't a huge investment on my part. But again, there's more we can do. We can make this a, a, a better user experience by doing more formatting, but this time to the body. So I pasted in the example code. I mean, it's not really a, that great actually, but it's a start. And so I can put it into something like Notepad, make a few changes and have it come in a way that it's visually appealing. It's got the, the, the name of the business process. These are issue details the title, the dynamic, and then it's broken down into these chunks that make uh, the information more consumable, but also reflective of the, the, the stages of the business process. And there's a lot you can do. And again, like I don't know how to write this code, but I do know how to customize it. And that's what I've done here. So now I'm starting to 
create this customized solution for my users to make them feel like I've invested in them, I've understood their business process, and now I'm just looking for opportunities to add value where it makes sense. One of the most important things that we can do with a business process that has some type of end date or expiration date is to give them a reminder. Let them intervene. Give them that notice that it's time to act before it's too late. So I'm going to use the scheduled flow that we created earlier that does the days old calculation and add more housekeeping to it, if you will. And so to do that, I'm going to need a uh, uh, another variable. This one will control the number of days that uh, we will get our reminders to. So in this case, I want reminders 30 days out. I'm going to set another variable. And this will be the date, the reminder date. So if we say 30 days from today, uh, let's say that's uh, February 14th or 13th, whatever the, the, the difference is, uh, give us that reminder date. So we're going to do uh, an expression here. It's called add days. We'll use UTC now, which is the current date. We'll use our num days variable. So we're adding 30 days and then we've just formatted the date in a way that looks a little more friendly. So I'm going to save it and I'm going to test it. I'm going to get the, the date that comes out from the reminder date. Uh, and I'm going to take that value, manually put it into my list just for the, the purposes of doing a test here. So there's the date. And then I'll hop back into my list. And we'll just manually update this date. This form formatting that we've done carries over so well into the, the team's experience. And there's so much more you can do. The, uh, the samples that are available on, uh, on GitHub around this stuff are really impressive. And again, you can start with something that's built and extend it to, to suit your needs. So it, it's a great uh, it's a great invest. It's a great investment on your part because you're adding value without having to do all the legwork. OK, so we're going to get uh, more items from SharePoint, and this one will be uh, for all of the records. From the issue tracker where that reminder date uh, matches the variable that we just declared. So to do that, we're going to do a filter query and we're going to say due date uh, is equal to. And then we'll put the reminder date in. And again, we'll have a, 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 a sub filter here to only take those items where the status is not complete. In other words, just give me the things that are open. So we've done a save. We've got a set of data now. I know this is not the prettiest way of looking at it, but we can see data in that output from the get items, and that confirms that we can proceed. And so we're going to take our data set, put it into a loop. That's the apply to each. Very good. Get items, issue tracker, reminders, and we'll take the value from that data set to be the basis of our loop. <clears throat> and now we're going to use Teams, and we're going to post a simple chat message to the user that the issue is assigned to. And this will this message will simply say, this thing's coming due in 30 days, take action with the a link of convenience to get back into the item so they can view the details. It'll be delivered as the flow bot, and that'll just keep a, a, a consistent listing of all the messages from that user. We'll put in the uh, email of the person that is assigned to. And then we'll we'll craft our simple message. Um, this interface allows us to use the dynamic data that we get from uh, the subsequent actions inside of uh, Flow, but it also has the ability to go into like uh, HTML mode, and that's what I've done here because I want to uh, um, include a link 
with a friendly name, just like we were doing for the folder. I don't want that link to be the that long SharePoint thing that will scroll across the screen three times and it's not clickable. So I, I want to put in an actual link. And so uh, I'm going through this effort once to uh, to make that uh, work. And I'm just putting a message saying, reminder, this item is due in 30 days. Here's the link for you to take action. It, it's a bit understated, um, but it's immensely valuable because it it gives that nudge to users before things expire. So I, I check back into Teams. Here's my Power Automate bot, and here's the link to go to the item and the message saying, hey, this thing's due in 30 days, take action. It's good. It's a great step forward, but there, there's more we can do. Uh, adaptive cards are there and uh, they're available to us in different platforms, but the uh, on first glance, it can be intimidating to to configure one of these things. Just like doing the form edits with JSON for me is I think complicated, but they have this great website. It's the adaptivecards.io designer site, and you're able to create a card. So in this case, I picked this uh, restaurant example. And now I'm able to customize it using a, their front end. Uh, I change the workload to Microsoft Teams. Quick preview in, and this is going to give me more meaningful information. And hopefully the message uh, will not get lost in all of those uh, Teams messages that sometimes people, you know, they get overwhelmed with if they're uh, uh, getting lots of messages from people. And and so like this this code, like give me a break. I would never be able to write this stuff. But what I can do is take that that foundational work that that example provides us, update it to customize my needs, configure really, and start using some of that dynamic data that we're pulling in from the the flow. And so I, I'm adding the title dynamically. I'm adding the the number of days dynamically. And so my hope is that. Instead of giving the users just that one line, I want to give them something that uh, has information, context, and the ability to take action. And this is just the the start of uh, uh, of what you can do with adaptive cards. This is just a, a single one way communication. There's many more options for those who are, are willing to invest the time to learn how to do it. Uh, but if you're like me and you just need uh, something that is going to be, uh, you know, a nice experience for users uh, and, and gives them what they need, then this is this is how it's done. Uh, I'm given uh, this card and I have information, contacts, and I'm able to take action. and. Uh, this is pretty awesome. And uh, like I said, so much more can be done with adaptive cards. And when you package up adaptive cards with Power Automate and with our, our Microsoft list, all within the context of Teams, that 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 hub for work or that digital home, you have a solution without having to develop a solution. You've configured one. Cool stuff. So, <clears throat> excuse me, losing my voice. What did we do? We took that deliver template and we moved it into the teams. This is where our people are working. We want to bring the work, we want to bring the information into that workspace for them. We extended the functionality by creating a folder. Doesn't sound like much, but it sure beats that experience of having to work against list attachments. It is a simple interface within the list to navigate those folders. Uh, we also uh, have give them the opportunity to work with the office apps and services around those files that they're used to. We've done conditional formatting to the, the various columns that will add value. And the idea there is not to make it pretty, the idea is to draw their attention to the items that need the most attention, to prioritize the workload, as it were. 
Uh, we had flows that did some of the mundane work for us, like calculating days old. Uh, uh, sending reminders was a, a big deal that, that we were able to do and we're bringing immense value to them. Uh, we had that button flow that uh, can take a, a flow and move it from one list to another, but more importantly, change that state within a business process if that's something that you're facing. We updated that the, the, the forms inside of, uh, of lists to be uh, a better user experience, to have a better business flow. And these, these marginal gains, these small turns of the, the dial that we have done really translate into measurable value that we're bringing to those users, especially to those ones who get left behind. You know, those, those small teams, departments, that maybe aren't included in those large ERP implementations. Think about the move that we all made uh, at the start of the pandemic. Yes, people are doing chats and meetings, but are they really working in teams? Are they, are they working collaboratively? Are they working out loud in a way that takes advantage of the tool set that they have at their disposal? There's a good chance they're not, but by modernizing their processes, using these tools as a solution platform, it does make sense and it does add value. Please, if there's any questions, we have time to, to take them on. And if not, that's fine. We can uh, connect uh, through social media, uh, create raffles and giveaways. I uh, have not had lunch yet, so every time I see the uh, Chicago prize pack, I'm getting quite hungry. Uh, gift cards, Xbox, I know my kids would love that one. Thank you, Gary. Please, uh, please take the time to uh, fill out the, the short speaker survey. Um, I don't talk for a living, so uh, constructive feedback would definitely help me. And for the event as well. These things uh, are not easy to put together. So thank you. Uh, finally, uh, thank you so much for taking time out. Um, I, I really uh, I, I really appreciate your time. There's some amazing speakers. Uh, so you've taken the time to attend mine. I, I appreciate it so much. I hope you have a, a great day and all the best. Take care for now.